Okay, good morning, everyone. All right, let's begin this time with a prayer, and then we'll get into our session. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, God. We thank you for yet another opportunity to come and learn and sit at your feet. And Lord, even as we learn this morning, we pray for your guidance. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will teach us, you will minister to our hearts, oh God. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I know it's been quite a while uh, since we came back on this topic. Uh, last class, we did chapter 10. Uh, we are looking at the responsibilities and rewards of the pastor from basically pulling out most of the uh, details from First and Second Timothy and the letter uh, of, of Titus, right? Uh, now, we did about six points right let me just quickly do a review of how many of what we covered last class firstly we talked about we are talking about responsibilities one biblical teaching preaching and teaching right so we we said as a pastor we must learn the word and rightly interpret the word of god biblical teaching so we can teach many things but we need to biblically teach and preach god's word two is shepherd the flock uh, I hope you've made a note with those verses as well. Shepherding the flock, that is to take care of, to look after the sheep that God has placed under your care. Please provide spiritual counsel. Now, even as we provide spiritual counsel, remember, we cannot take the place of God. God is God. We may know a lot of things. We may, know not, we may not have all the answers. That's all right. Right? So even in a pastoral calling, people will come and ask you questions. What should I do? Uh, now, we must understand that there's a certain way to give counseling. Right? There is a certain uh, you know, places where we can answer. There are certain areas which we cannot answer. Questions cannot be answered. Example, somebody comes up to you and says, as a pastor, they, you know, they, they're coming up to you and saying, Pastor, why did... Why did I lose my loved one? Now, we may not have the answers. We cannot say you did this or he did this. And sometimes we don't have the answers. Right? When it comes to spiritual counseling, there are places where we can give them counsel. So they come up, they ask, Pastor, how, how do I read the word? I'm not able to understand. So you give them some guidance. I'm not able to pray. You give them some guidance. I'm not, I don't know what uh, step to take in my, in my, about my future. Give them some guidance. And even as we give them counsel and guidance, we are not coercing them, we are not forcing them, but we are just encouraging them, leading them uh, to make a decision on their own, right? Fourthly, one of the responsibilities of a pastor, very important, is leading and overseeing staff. The moment you get into this place of leadership, we have to learn to lead, right? A leader leads. A leader doesn't come to a place of just sitting and doing nothing. He's not a leader. Now, if, you, if we call ourselves a leader and we're not doing anything about it, there's something wrong. We have to change. right? So we lead and we oversee our teams. Right? Now, many of us are from towns and villages. Over time, you will have associate pastors. You have team leaders. You may have a lot of volunteers coming into your church. Now, you must be able to oversee the leadership there. For example, your church is growing. You have 100 people, and now you have quite a few youth. You appoint a youth pastor. Now you must be able to oversee what the youth pastor is doing. Oversee. You need to take care. It's not like you, in, in leadership, it's not like you assign and leave it. That's not how it is. Right? You've got to um, follow up and oversee what the, the team and the staff is doing. Fifthly, we looked at prayer and intercession. Very important. One of the main responsibilities of a pastor is what? Prayer and intercession. What you do in your private will show in public. You, you're a prayerful person, you'll have a prayerful church. If there's a person who's more interested in the things of the world as a pastor, the church also will have that. It's a replica. You replicate what you are as a leader. right? Then 
so this is a place where you and I must really build ourselves on, right? And the best part is we can never come to a place and say, I am satisfied, right? With prayer. I'm satisfied with what I'm doing. There's always the desire for more. And as pastors, we must desire for more. God, I need more of you. I want to spend more time in your presence. I need to pray more. I need to intercede for the, my congregation, for my city, for what we are doing as a church in our nation. We must be prayerful people. Right? And then we stopped here, visitation and outreach. There'll be times when we will have to, uh, you know, we will be visiting families. Uh, uh, and then there is outreach. Be, remember local church, we're talking about it, be uh, apostolic in nature. So there will come a time as a church, you will grow from stage to stage to stage. And then you come to a stage where you will have to go out, reach out. Now, it's not necessary you have to wait for five years or 10 years to be able to do outreach. Even if you have 20, 30 people in your church, you can do it, right? Uh, but as a pastor, you can lead by example. Show them, teach them how to do it. One of the things that we always <clears throat> emphasize is that we got to teach people. Sometimes we feel that they're not going to do it, which is wrong. We are making false assumptions. When we teach people, let them know why we must do it and the importance of doing it, they will learn it. And I, and I think well, one of the examples I always use is, you know, in the city of Mangalore, we had a lot of, when I went there, we had a lot of retired people, what? people in their 50s, 60s. And we were teaching about evangelism, how to, you know, why is it important to evangelize? There will be the enemy, there will be persecution, but we should not fear. And so we used to go out in teams. Now imagine this, you've got a 60-year-old, 65-year-old, we're going to the mall, giving out tracts. Were they fearful? Yes. Now, it's not like I pushed them. We taught them the importance. We, we kept it, kept the opportunity open and they joined us. And now it's become a habit. Now they sometimes they call, they message me and say, we went to this place and did outreach. You know? Why? Because now I'm not talking about youth. They are you know, 60 and above senior citizens. They're doing it. So I think as leaders, we must set the example, teach, set the example, and give the opportunity to people. We never know. Never in my dreams would I have thought that the people that I saw would be people who will go out and do outreach and you know go to colleges, give out tracts, but they're doing it. Right? So, so outreach, visitation, and outreach again is another important aspect. Okay, let's go to the next point. Seventh point: leading and administrating the sacraments of the church. Right, Ad leading and administrating the sacraments of the church. Uh, what are the sacraments of the church? Right? What are the things that we do? One, water baptism, baby dedication, all stable. All these are the sacraments of the church. Now, as a pastor, we must learn to lead in this. Now, why why am I saying we must learn? Partaking in the Lord's table is not a big deal. We can do it at home, in our private times. The Apostle Paul says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. Right? But when you are ministering in a church setting, it's a different story altogether. Right? So how can you and I as leaders, we must know what to say, we must know how to say it, we must know how to administer the sacraments, meaning the Lord's table. How do, how do I administer what I'm doing? Can I tell the church, okay, everyone get ready. We're going to partake in the Lord's table. Did you open the packet? Yes. Okay, you see there's a small wafer there. You eat that. Then after you eat that, you just have to peel out that top layer and then you'll have a grape juice. You drink that. After you drink that, you'll go directly to heaven. Now, 
Is that the right way to administer? No. So I must learn as a pastor how to administer. So I got to talk about what the cross is, what we are doing. Why are we doing this? What Jesus did thousands of years ago, why should we do it now? What is the significance of the Lord's table? So I must be able to administer it the right way. So I say, okay, this is earthly elements, simple earthly elements, wafer and juice. But we are doing this in remembrance of what Jesus told us to do. And when we do that, we are partaking of his death, his burial, and resurrection. And we are inviting his resurrection power into our life. We are remembering the body that was bruised on the cross. We are remembering the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And so when we partake of this earthly elements, we are remembering the power of the cross. And we are allowing, inviting the power of the cross to come into our lives. Now what am I doing? Now, you know, maybe there are people in the congregation, they don't know what it is. Remember the Corinthian church? They were taking it like breakfast, bread and juice. They didn't understand. Now, you can't blame them because it's the early church. We know now. Right? We have so much, we understood. Our revelation is more than them. So, when I'm ministering this, I must be able to teach them. Right? To administer it in the right way. Same thing about water baptism. Every, I think it's first Sunday at APC, we have water baptism service. Sorry, Holy Spirit baptism service. Right? So if those of us who want to be uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, you can come after service. We pray. For, what do we do? We teach what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. What can you expect as a believer? What, are, what happens when you are baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, how the Holy Spirit comes? How does he reveal and manifest himself in our lives we teach it then we pray for them we give them an opportunity to experience the power of the holy spirit now if i'm not able to administer this and pray with them for the baptism of the holy spirit if i just say you know what you pray jesus said he'll give no you pray he'll give you it's of no help I, i'm not doing things the right way Remember this, we can do many things, good things, the wrong way. And many wrong things in a good way. So we must understand, okay, why, when I'm doing this, am I able to minister to the people in my congregation? Same thing with water baptism. <clears throat> what about water baptism? People will have questions. Why should I be water baptized? Is it a prerequisite for me to be water baptized to go in uh, to you know have the gifts of the spirit or to speak in tongues? Why should I be? Should I wait till I'm 18? What is the significance of the water baptism? How is it by dipping yourself in water? My relationship with God is between me and God. I don't have to prove to people to be water baptized. People have these questions. So you and I, as pastors or leaders, must be able to teach it to administer it effectively. So I, so what you can say, you say, see, this is what water baptism is. Book of Romans says, when you go into the water, you are identifying with his death, his burial, his resurrection. Jesus himself got water baptized. It's a physical declaration of your belief and your faith in Jesus Christ. And so there is no age limit. You can be 15 years old, you can be 55 years old. Doesn't matter. But what happens after you're baptized? What are baptized? You're opening your life to the work of the Holy Spirit to come into your life. Next question. Is it a prerequisite that I should be water baptized? Only then I can flow in the gifts of the Spirit. No, it's not a prerequisite. So you're teaching them. You understand where we're coming from, right? So in the congregation, as we minister these things, uh, it's very important for us to teach it. And thankfully, in Bible college, we have all of this, right? And I'm sure most of us know this. 
So when you get into your roles of ministry, don't assume that people already know. Teach it. Say it. That's why even on Sundays when we are partaking in the Lord's table, every time we share a word of exhortation, what it means, because we don't know what people believe. We may have people who are new in the church who have no idea what's happening. They're just believers. Last Sunday they became a believer. They've come back this Sunday. They have no idea what is the Lord's table. So you must be able to teach it and minister it effectively. Next one, mentoring and discipleship. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2. Go ahead. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Hmm. And the things um, Paul is writing, remember, now this should always be in the background. Paul is writing his last epistle before his death. So before his death, before he is being martyred he's writing this very very important letter so he's saying something very important here he's saying and the things that you have heard me say talking to Timothy in the presence of many witnesses my version says entrust them to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others everyone say entrust to entrust means to hand over to give responsibilities and trust them to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. Now, one, one of the things that we always emphasize in, in APC and also it's emphasized on the scripture is the sign of a good leader is the number of leaders he will be able to, he or she is able to raise. That's a sign of a good leader. Okay, I'm going to repeat that. The sign of a good leader or a great leader is how many leaders he or she is able to raise. When you look at church history, we have many, many, many great leaders. One example is uh, William J. Seymour, right? Uh, uh, the Azusa Street Revival. He had a wonderful church, wonderful ministry. What happened? If you read a story, it's very strange. Thousands of people in the church. He was the only one who was looking after the church, meaning preaching, teaching. Thousands of people. And then there came a time when you know he was unwell, he couldn't look after the church, things happened. Just the church disintegrated. He got a burnout. You know what's a burnout? Stress. Physically drained out, mentally drained out, emotionally drained out. People left the church. Finally, there was no one to take over this ministry which thousands of people came to. Very important lesson for us. See, God can... Now, he did a wonderful work. Azusa Street Revival, we are still talking about it. But where did he miss out? He didn't raise up leaders to take on the ministry. Now, in pastoring, you and I are to mentor and raise up leaders, disciple people. And the perfect example is the great apostle Paul himself. Perfect example. Took this young man, Timothy, wherever he went, trained him, taught him. He saw what ministry is all about. Raised him up to be a young, strong man in leadership. And he didn't say, Timothy, please, you be with me only, no, because I, I'm going through all these problems. He said, Timothy, go. Ephesus is yours. You go look after the church. Powerful, powerful, uh, you know, imagery of discipleship. 
Look at in the Old Testament, there's two examples. Moses, he saw in Joshua that there was something in him. He gave Joshua responsibilities. And there came a time when God himself said, Joshua, get ready. You're next. But the opportunity was there. Moses trained up Joshua. He gave Joshua responsibilities, opportunities, and he was able to take it up. Look at Elijah and Elisha. Wonderful story of uh, just discipleship or a mantle that's being passed on. Elijah was ready to go. Elisha said, I'm never going to leave you. Eventually, he got a second a double portion of the anointing of Elijah. But a bad example would be Elisha, Elisha and Gehazi. Now, it was not Elisha's fault. Gehazi's mind was more focused on money rather than what God can do. Think of this. I read it, it's very strange. Eli Gehazi saw a leper coming to the door. Neman. Second time, he saw a healed person coming to the door. Same person, healed. He didn't think, oh, God has healed this man. What a powerful God. But he looked at the other side of the story. He's got a lot of money with him. So maybe I can tap into that. If he had only directed his thoughts and said, money will come and go, but I am next in line to be the prophet in Israel. Elijah gave it to Elisha. Elisha, from Elisha, I am the next. I should get this. It is my opportunity. But he messed it up. Right? Look at the, these examples of mentoring and discipleship. As leaders, remember, we mentor people, we disciple people. We do our part. But, just like sometimes, you know, Gehazi, there will be people who may not be really interested. They may just step out of that, you know, of that shadow or of that leadership role. They don't want it. That's okay. One thing that we learn in scriptures and we emphasize is you and I can raise up disciples, disciples and leaders, but we cannot force them. To be with you, be with you. You cannot force them. You have to do this. No. Right. So, mentor and disciple. When it comes to mentoring, you know it's a whole different topic altogether. Right. Uh, mentoring and discipleship. Actually, if you separate them, you have a whole course on mentoring and the whole course on discipleship. Right. Next year, you have I think discipleship and small groups. Discipleship. It's a powerful, powerful aspect of a pastor, of a leader. What did Jesus do? Firstly, when he decided he's going to start his ministry, first thing, chose the disciples, 12 of them. Such a beautiful example, right? Why did Jesus have to choose 12 people? He could have just chosen one or two of them and said, okay, you guys can do it. He chose 12. He walked with them. They, he showed his life to them. He showed his the human side of him and the, the supernatural, the godly side of him. They saw him in the Mount of Transfiguration. His body was glorified. They saw him walking on water. They saw him, you know, uh, cleansing the lepers, healing the blind. They saw him do those miraculous things, but they also saw him eating. They saw him sleeping. They saw him tired. They saw him weeping. They saw him weary. They saw both the sides. And Jesus, when he raised up these disciples, he mentored them and he discipled them. That even to the point that even in their failures, he still, he still, you know, he didn't write them off. Very good example, right? We've come to a time sometime, not everywhere, but I think. You know, I believe that sometimes we, as leaders, especially when we get into ministry, we learn, we learn, we learn, we get into a certain level of ministry, right? 10, 15 years in ministry. So we've understood what ministry is about. 
uh, you know, how to handle people, how to handle situations. And then when we're raising up other leaders, we expect them to behave like us, not understanding that, hey, they're just new in the Lord, or they're just learning in leadership. They're just taking their baby steps. And sometimes we can be hard on them. Look at Jesus. He brought correction. He brought rebuke. But he did it out of love. And this is an aspect that we must learn. If I don't correct you, I have failed as a leader. If I see something wrong, I remember last time, last time I was speaking to you all, I was telling you all, you know, do this, keep reading the word, keep praying. Why do I say that? Not because I don't have anything to say. Because I want to see you all growing up to be leaders. And it becomes a habit. Right? So in leadership, we, we mentor, we disciple, we take them through a journey. Along the journey, people will leave, people sometimes will stay. That's OK. We'll go next to rewards. God is our rewarder, right? So mentoring and discipleship. Ninth one. Yes, go ahead. So as a pastor, when you're trying to mentor uh, some disciples or people who are there in the church, uh, do you mentor all of them who come to you in the form of you know regularity and uh, you know people are very active in the church or you wait on the holy spirit to uh, seek who do you mentor who do you anoint who do you uh, you know nurture okay here's the thing see some things that we follow again i've missed to mention this when it comes to mentoring it's always male and male female and female that's something that we do at apc now if girls come i just direct them to uh, uh, any any of our pastors, women, or or our counselors, or uh, somebody in the church who can help them, some of the life group leaders. Now, if there are a couple of guys right, who come and they say, "Hey, uh, I want to," you know, you tell me this. So you see, most probably people won't come. Mostly people don't come and say, "I want to be mentored by you." They don't say that, especially here, right? In my setting, nobody has come and said, "I want to be mentored by you." Uh, but there are young people or people that I know of in church, young couples especially. Uh, they have come. They, have, they, you know, they say, "I want to meet you. I want to talk to you." And there are times I've spent an hour, two hours, just talking to them. And so they want to know about ministry. They want to know what step should I take, uh, or how to, you know, lead by how to, how to make decisions, things like that. So now, I am available for everyone. Right. It's very easy for me as a leader to look at people and say, hey, this guy may not be able to do it. Or that guy may not be able to do this. But I can be completely wrong. Maybe in God's eyes, that guy can do and the other person can't do. Because sometimes we look at skills and gifts and talents and say, hey, he has this gift. Of course, all of that is there. See, for example, there are... There are a couple of them in our church at our location who are very good musicians, very good. And they're very regular to church, and they keep coming to church, and uh, they serve in the church. So I keep telling them, hey, why don't you audition for the worship team? Right? And it's been one year I've been telling them. But they're not too keen. Now, I cannot force them. Now, they're very good guitarists, very good. Right? They will get in. They know they're good, but they don't want to do it. So I can't force them. But they do come and ask questions. They do come and you know, uh, ask about the Bible, especially you know, in certain times uh, when it comes to family or so, you know, series like Acts and End Times. You know, when we have these kind of series, they have a lot of questions. They come up and talk. So it's not, in my mind, it's not like, OK, this person is somebody who I know. Uh, you know this is the only person that I will mentor or I will talk to. No, I'm open. I make time. Now, there are times when it goes beyond. There's this one person in church. He, young guy, maybe about 25. He said, I want to talk to you. So he came. He, he said, you know, these are the problems I'm going through. So I was just talking to him every week. I just talked to him. Uh, you know, I leave his name unnamed. But he was suicidal, right? Regularly, 
So, so any Sunday he doesn't come, I would call him. I would message him every now and then. Just try to get in touch with him. Uh, because I, you know that anything can happen with these guys. So, um, and then he would, I would take him out for uh, maybe outreach. Uh, there were times we, uh, you know, when we are going as a family, we would say, hey, come for you know lunch or something. Now, this guy, I know his problem. I know what he's going through. But there are times when, you know, it, it just goes beyond us, meaning I, I'm not able to help him. So he needs professional counseling. Just that one hour is not going to help. He needs like a constant counseling. So that's when we lead them towards Chrysalis counseling. Because I will not be able to spend, you know, three, four hours with him. Maybe in a week, okay, but but this person needs every week constant professional counseling. I just lead them. I say, hey, you know, we have a professional counseling team. We can connect there. Now, that's an advantage we have at APC. But what about in churches where there is no professional counseling? You, What you can do is you can ask him to check online, get him connected to some pro Christian professional counselors. Uh, but in the meanwhile, you're also in touch with him. You're, you're, you know, you're still checking on him, how he's doing and all of it. So I would say I'm open to people, talking to people and all that. Uh, but when it goes beyond certain, you know, certain places, then I, I just hand it over to our Chrysalis team. Right. Yeah. Uh, ninth point is stewarding and financial oversight. First Corinthians chapter four and verse two. First Corinthians four and two. Let's read that. First Corinthians chapter four and verse two. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Just verse 2. 4 verse 2 says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove themselves faithful. Look at what Paul is saying. He's telling the church, those who I have, you have as a leader, those whom you have given trust, they must prove themselves faithful. How do we prove somebody is faithful? Now, I can go to a person and say, you know, I may think, okay, this person looks like he's going to be a faithful person. Now, I'm making a judgment, right? I'm just saying, okay, looks like he's a faithful guy. I can trust him. But Paul is saying here, you got to prove yourself faithful. That means you give them opportunities and ask them to prove themselves to be faithful. And then you get them into this place of leadership. So basically, it's you're giving them an op opportunity and you're saying, be good stewards of this. And I go always, I go by one principle. Be faithful in small things. God will give you bigger things. That's something that's in my heart always. I go by that. God gives you small opportunities. God gives you small things to do in life. Be faithful in that. And as you're faithful in the small, be good, being good stewards of what small things you have, God will be able to give you bigger things. I remember this. In my when I was in a Bible college student, some of uh, you know very strange people used to write things on the table. In the break time, I had bought I I, I had seen it right on the table, so I started what is this? Yeah. It was something was bothering me. Why are people writing on the table? There is paper to write on paper, right? Something was bothering me. During those days, we had only uh, uh, DTH. So it was a uh, two-year course, and of course, uh, first and second year. 
So I saw all of this. Something was bothering me. I said, God, how can I ignore that? Now it's a silly thing, right? It's not very important. How can I ignore it? So one day over, two days over, it was bothering me. So I went, one, I remember the lunch break, I went, I bought two big erasers. And I came to class during the lunch break, I would sit and rub them. Right. Because people had written in pencil and pen. I rubbed them, oh, get upset. What the hell? You know, how can people write on the desk? It's common sense. God has put you in this place. And we must be good stewards of what God has given us. So I sit and rub everything. But I thought to myself, I'm being a good steward of what God has given, placed in my hands. So there will come a time when I will teach people that. I've never used this example over the past 14 years. It's the first time I'm using this example because I just remembered. I always thought there will come a time when I'm teaching my student, when I will teach in this Bible college, and I will tell my students to do this while I was rubbing that. I, mean, I can just picture that day. It's in my mind. Now, why am I saying this? When we are faithful in small things, as stewards, God will give us bigger things. And when we, our responsibility is to be good stewards, and we give the opportunity to others to prove themselves to be good stewards and to be faithful of what God has given them. You get what I'm saying? Right? God may give you something small. Do it faithfully. Be a good steward. Nobody may appreciate you. You may not be, people may not clap for you. People may not say, oh, wonderful job. And nobody may even know what you've done. You've gone, you've done something, and you've come. Nobody knows. God knows. Right? So be good stewards as a leader so that when you are raising up other leaders, you give them opportunities, you teach them the importance of stewardship, and they have the opportunity to prove themselves faithful. Right? The same ninth one, financial oversight. Again, when it comes to money, be a good steward. Right. Money is the top three reasons why ministries fail and crumble. One of the top three reasons. I would say first reason is immorality. Right? Second is money. Money can completely stop a person from thinking. Now, when you have 100 people in church, that's OK. Whatever you get, you put into the church. Come on, I want to see the church grow. Then the church becomes 300 people. Now you're having a regular flow of money coming in. Then it becomes 500 people, a regular flow. Then there are people in the church who say, I want to give for this. I want to give for that. So there's a regular flow of income. Then it becomes 700,000 people. You've got regular flow of income. Now it's very easy as a leader to make things to, to fall in this area. And one, some of the things that we do at APC is every penny that comes into the church is accounted for. Even if it's one rupee coin, it's accounted for. It is accounted for. If you open our website, everything that we have spent over the years, it's there. The financial reports are there. So if you go 2023, go to the website, go to our financials, you'll see everything. How much came in, how much money was spent, this much money was spent on Bible college, this much was spent on conferences, this much was spent on missions, uh, this is was spent on other events. Everything is there. So suddenly somebody may come up in the church and say, I had given this for certain amount. I want to know what, where the amount has gone in terms of missions. So what do we tell them? Sure. It's all on the website. 
you can go there and see it. If you have any more questions, we have our accountant. You can speak to the accountant. If you have still more questions, we are there to talk to you as pastors. I'll explain to you. But all the financials are there. And we are not doing, we have a we have outsourced. So we have a person from another place coming, doing all our accounting for us. So there's no bias. We're not being biased, right? So everything is done. Everything, paperwork, everything is done in a clean way. Even the point of buying the land that we bought recently, everything was done in white. How much is the land? This is the amount. We have the funds. We have the receipts for that exact amount. It's not like this is showing some amount and the uh, uh, we have paid different amount. No. Everything is equal. Example, one, one CR, here also is one CR. It's not showing 1.5 CR here. It's the same. Financial integrity. As pastors, you start off small. As leaders, we start small. So when the church is small itself, you set up your heart to be right before God. Right. Uh, now, now I understand things may be different when it comes to towns and villages, and you know the setting is different. Right? Pastors usually whatever they get from their tithe, they use it for their family and for the church. That's all right. But make an account of it. Okay, this church came in. This much I kept for my home. This rest is for the church. Now, that what is going towards the church, these are the things we'll buy. Right? For the house, this is what I need every month for my family. So you're dividing it. And your, your good thing to do is to write it down. So when people ask you, you have something to show. Now, that is when I'm talking about there's 50, 60 people. Now, as soon as possible, get an accountant. Or get somebody who can do this for you. You don't handle the money. The best example is Paul the Apostle. Very simple, I forget the verse, but very simple thing. Paul is has to go to Jerusalem. He wants to go to Jerusalem because the church and churches around Philippi, Thessalonica have given him an offering to go give it to the church in Jerusalem. So Paul is saying. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm not going alone. You have given me the offering. I'm taking Titus and Epaphroditus with me. Two people. I'm taking two people. So that you all don't blame me for anything. What a powerful example. Apostle Paul didn't say, hey, I went and met Jesus in heaven. I met him here on earth. I met him in heaven also. I had great revelations. So I'm an apostle. I can do what I want. No. Just so that there's no blame coming. No one can point a finger. I'm taking two of them. I'm not handling the money. They will handle it. I'm just going along with them. We'll give it to the church in Jerusalem. And once we give it, we will notify you. We'll call you and let you know. Done. What are we doing? Being good stewards of what God has given us. Right? Yes, Akil. Finance, especially in the ministry for people who are starting, and uh, you know, thing. Why is it uh, usually uh, there is a lot of uh, hindrance or uh, challenges in the area of finance, especially for people who are new into the ministry and thing? Is it that God is teaching us to uh, have more faith than the things, or is it something else that uh, He, I think, He blesses as time goes by and He continues to take care of the ministry? But initially, why there is so much of a stronghold and uh, thing in most of the ministries? Yeah. So. I would say this, see, we need to also see the setting. So you're talking about what what do you what are you looking at? What's in your mind? You're looking at a village, town, or a city. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the thing is, see, here's the thing, especially that's why we teach this at villages and when we go out on uh, missions and all of it. See, God has called us for something. But we need to come out of this thing of, you know, uh, uh, you know, it's wrong to work. We emphasize that it's good to work. Paul the Apostle worked. 
right? So he worked as a tent maker. So the problem is when we don't work, we need, so example, you want to start in uh, a, a city. You want to start a church. What do you need? You need at least a certain a place. You need sound system, a couple of mics to start off with. Something basic. So I will need a one lakh, for example. Or even if you're starting at home, right? Maybe a small, you know, speaker. Something you'll need to buy. Now that also, if you're depending on the church, it's not going to work. And then they'll say, "Oh Lord, it's very difficult. I'm not able to start church. No, it's not planned. That's all it is." Right. So, for example, think of it this way: If I have to go to another country and live, will I just pack my bag and say, "God is my provider," and go? Even if I get my visa in my hand, I'm going to think of hundred things. One is, okay, I go there. First is a place to stay. For me to get a place to stay, there's a certain deposit I have to pay. Then I have to look out for a job, or I have to even if I have a job in my hand. How do I go? How do I how do I travel? There are many things that are involved. Same thing when you're doing something that is eternal, like a local church. How much more we we must be prepared? So I think as I'm not saying everywhere, but I know of some of some places that we have missions going on. When we go, we meet pastors who say Monday to Friday they're working in the farm. Right? I know another pastor. He's a plumber. Right in uh, in Maharashtra, he's a plumber. He goes. He does plumbing work Monday to Friday. And whenever he's free, he goes for evening prayers, everything. He finishes work, goes for it. Sunday morning, he's, he's doing the pastoral role. Right? So he one of the things, the best thing about him is he doesn't depend on people for money. So he puts petrol, he goes, visits people, God blesses, right? Or he prays, God gives. So his focus now is not how to get money, but his focus is how to build a church. So now he's thinking, uh, you know, recently I spoke to him. He was saying, I want to take these, you know, these government loans and I want to, uh, you know, try and get a land, speak to the government, see if I can talk to them. And if they can give me just thousand square feet, it's enough. I'll build like a 200 seater, 100, 150 people can sit. So you pray about it. Very nice. I said, have, what have you done? I'm doing all the paperwork. I have some funds. He's wise. He's a pastor for the past five years. He's wise. He's very wise. Because he's working. He's providing for his family. He's saving up. God will bless what we have. Because God is a supernatural God. If I don't give him, he, he will supernaturally provide. But we have to give him something that he can take and multiply and bless. Right? Um, yeah, so that's very important. We must understand that. Last point, practical ministry administration, Acts 20, verse 28. Let's just quickly read that, Acts 20 and 28. Yeah, I'll read that. Keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock of, the, of, the, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Now, when it comes to, again, pastoral ministry, we must learn how to ad do administration. And there'll come a time you can appoint a staff as an administrator. Uh, but event initially, you and I uh, must develop the ability to, you know, the skill of administration so that you can, you know, you can uh, lead others and train others in the same area. Right? So this is, again, one other aspect. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many other smaller responsibilities that are involved. Uh, but these are some of the main responsibilities. So we'll stop here. Next class, we we'll look at the rewards of the pastor. What are our rewards? Right? All right. So have a good weekend. Uh, we'll catch up on Monday to look at rewards of the pastor. Right? God bless you all. Thank you.